It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 50. This is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Dan Breezebois, a founding member of Turnasol Cooperative Farm, begun in 2004. Located just outside of Montreal, Quebec, Turnasol is an employee-owned cooperative with five members engaged in about seven acres of vegetable and vegetable seed production. Dan provides an eye-opening discussion of his experience as part of a cooperative farming venture, including their use of holistic management to guide decision-making with regards to profitability and quality of life. We dig into some of the logistical details of how the Turnasol farmers plan their business and divide responsibilities, as well as how they make operational decisions together and how they assign leadership roles. And Dan lets us in on ways that being part of a co-op allows them to work less than many of the farmers they know, both day-to-day and seasonally. Dan manages garlic and seed production at Turnasol, and we discuss the details of seed selection and processing, as well as the planning and cropping adjustments that seed production requires. We also spend some time discussing crop planning on the vegetable farm, as Dan is the co-author of Crop Planning for Organic Vegetable Growers, which you really ought to check out if you haven't looked at that book. Like I said, Dan provided some really eye-opening information and insights in this episode. Have fun! The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soils for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmers Web, small business software for farmers. Farmers Web allows you to streamline wholesale ordering and operations, making it easier to work with your buyers, reducing costs, and increasing your capacity. FarmersWeb.com. Dan Breezebois, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Really glad we could make this work today. We were just talking about the weather in the pre-show chat. I think uh, you know, you're up in Quebec, and and it sounds like you're having the same sort of weather there that we're having in the Midwest. Yeah, it is unseasonably warm. Um, we're able to do stuff in the field now, and we normally, you know, normally this farm's been shut down from, from mid-November. Kind of just a weird, freaky fall here. Um, so just for, as, as a reference point, we're, we're recording the episode here in, uh, I guess we're in mid-December now. Dan, if you could, if we could start by having you tell us a little bit about Turnasol Farm and how that got started and and how it's currently constituted. I think that would kind of set the stage for us to have a really interesting conversation today. So uh, Turnasol Cooperative Farm uh, is run as a worker co-op, and uh, we're five people that manage and run the business together. Um, We met during our university studies, and we were studying agriculture. We started working on, you know, different farms. And um, then at one point when we were ready to be our, you know, our own boss and start running our own operation, um, we, you know, the group of us talked together and decided to launch into, into running a farm. And, uh, and we've been doing that since. When you say a worker-owned cooperative, tell us a little bit more about what that means. So this is a, a form of, uh, of incorporation or, or a business structure, um, just like being, a, I guess, a, a sole proprietor or, you know, incorporated. Um, and it's very similar to being incorporated as a, like a corporation. Um, but what's exceptional about a worker co-op is that each person has one vote independent of how many shares they might have in the business. And dividends at the end of the year are distributed in function of the number of hours worked with the business, as opposed to based on you know share or stock you have in the business, and um, yeah, so the five of us are are, are the, the the co-op members and um, so the, the worker owners, and and I guess to distinguish a, a worker co-op from other types of co-op, like I mean a buying co-op, um, the purpose of a worker co-op is to create employment for the members um, who are the workers. And um, and that's that's the goal of the co-op. And you guys do that, obviously, through a farming operation. How big is the farming operation? So our operation, we currently rent about 20 acres of land. Um, and we're grossing maybe about 400,000 off of that. Um, there's there's about of that 20 acres, maybe 12 and a half acres is tillable. And on that 12 and a half that's tillable, we have about maybe six and a half acres of vegetable or maybe six and a quarter acres of vegetable and like three quarter seed production. And so also in addition to the five of us who work on the operation, we also have, uh, in 2015, we had five employees working with us. It looks like in 2016, we're going to have seven employees. Uh, So we'll be 12 people um, working together uh, during that time. 
But those other seven people aren't actually part of the co-op, right? No. And that's something that's in transition. Up until the last couple of years, we've taken on um, our employees have been more you know, paid apprentices. So they, they are paid an hourly wage. But um, we were kind of focusing on, you know, training them in. And at the end of the year, they would go on and run their own farm or manage another farm. Um, but as we've expanded, we've begun to feel that. Um, well, so and in our early years, that was good because we were five people running the business already. So we didn't need to retain employees the same way. And it was kind of nice to have the turnover. But as we've expanded, it's been not, we're kind of seeing the value of people having more people staying with our farm longer. And um, so at present, we have one woman who's coming into her fourth year with us. Um, and we have a couple, maybe three people coming in next year with their second year with us. And so as people start staying longer, we're going to have to explore what it might mean for them to become co-op members. Though at this point, the the five co-op members have been the, that are there have been there from the beginning. And this is going to be a challenge that we're going to have to uh, to deal with as, as we get more co-op members. I would think that the whole idea of running a farm cooperatively would be one big challenge. It is one big challenge, but, um, you know, running any business is one big challenge. Um, so, yeah, running a farm as a cooperative is, is definitely challenging. Um, what Often when you're starting an operation like this, you're starting working with your close friends and your friends aren't necessarily chosen as your friends because of, you know, their, your business relationship. You know, you, you, you like them for all kinds of reasons. And but you re, like you discover people in a different way when you start running a business with them. And I, I would find in, I, I think in general um, in our society, most people don't totally know how to be a team player instinctively. Um, you know, it takes a lot of work. So in the early, first years of uh, of running our farm, the biggest challenge for us was learning how to work well together. You know, we were we were successful agriculturally or agronomically. We were successful financially. Um, we had really good weed control. But as a team, we hadn't quite gelled. And it took us, you know, three to five years to really start to work well as a team. And now that we have that down, um, uh, where we're able to accomplish a lot, like it's, 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 it's not more of a challenge now than it would be farming with your wife or, or husband or, uh, you know, or, 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 or a business partner. Um, but in the early years before we had those systems down, it really, there was some things we had to work through. Well, you say it's not more of a challenge than it would be to farm with a wife or a, hu a husband or a partner, but but you got five of you. I mean, you're talking a polyamorous relationship here. Well, uh, there is five of us, and what's nice is that it's not a polyamorous relationship. In that, you know, if you're farming with your husband or your wife, your life partner, you know, sometimes it's hard to discuss certain topics. You know, you might not want to put everything on the table. Um, whereas when you're dealing with it, it, like of the five of us, there are two couples and then there's Fred who's, whose wife works off farm. So, um, it's kind of nice cause there's three other, for the two couples, there's like three other people that can serve as a buffer between any conflict that might come within, um, an actual couple relationship. Um, so, so we are able to keep it more business than if it was, uh, if it, if it was a, a life relationship. Well, it is a life relationship in that we're going to be working together for a long time, but you know, we're not raising families together. Well, I just think it's such an interesting model with with the idea of having five people joining forces because it addresses so many challenges that farmers have with getting into business right now, particularly around well, areas of expertise and also just the availability of capital. I mean, to be able to put five people together you know, you only need one tractor for the farm when you're starting and to be able to divide that cost among five different people seems like that a really smart thing to do if you can make it work from a relationship standpoint. Uh, totally. Um, yeah. Had we started as our, as independently, we probably would have been three farms and we would have had, you know, three tractors or three PCS rototillers, you know, three washing stations, three cold rooms. And by being together, we were able to, uh, to just have you know, one of each of those things, um, though that one tractor has uh, has grown to a fleet of, uh, you know, three tractors and a cultivating tractor. But um, but in the early years, it was nice to um, 
to not have to invest in as much going in. And also in the early years, we didn't have to um, rely on finding uh, apprentices or employees early on because we had a team that was there year after year. So it wasn't until our third year that we started to hire outside help uh, to, 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 to work on the farm. Which must have been really nice from a learning standpoint, because that whole process of becoming an employer is a, a set of skill development in and of itself. Yeah, it was really nice. Um, the and and like our first, you know, so in our, in our third year when we had our first employee, we had just one, you know, employee uh, or one one apprentice. And then the next year, the same thing. And I think it was in our third year we had two apprentices. So it wasn't until like four or five years that we started to have you know four or five people working for us. So we were able to really work into it smoothly, and um, and also because there was five of us um, in the early years. It was rare that an apprentice would work alone. Um, they almost always had somebody right beside them, so able to train them in, um, you know, make sure that they're maintaining a, a good pace and keeping standards, um, which has been something of a, a surprise. Like, which, 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 as we've hit four and five employees and now seven employees, uh, when we first hit these numbers, it kind of caught us unawares that we wouldn't be able to be next to that apprentice all the time. And uh, so nowadays we often have a team of, uh, of employees working out uh, in the field without us, um, though we try to be there as much as we can. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, been a, it's been a different kind of, uh, it's been a different learning experience as, as an employer, one that was a lot smoother. As a, as a five member management team, essentially for the farm, you each have different areas of the farm that you're responsible for, right? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. How do you guys divide that up? Um, it's, it's been a process of dividing that over the years. And initially, um, we divided a lot based on what people's strong interests were and their, 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 their capacities or affinities. Um, Though some some tasks, you know, you have to have somebody do something with, um, and over the years we've kind of tweaked it to 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 see, you know, make sure it's the right person at the right job, and make sure we have all the tasks covered. But um, like nowadays, you know, there's one person that takes care of the bookkeeping. Um, there's one person that's managing the greenhouse. One person, you know, deals with all the organic certification. Um, I manage the seed production. Uh, another person manages um, sort of the tractor and machinery maintenance and also the infrastructure maintenance. Um, so we've, you know, we've kind of broken up the whole farm and uh, into different areas. And there's, you know, a manager or a coordinator for each of those areas. And, um, and then that person, um, we do decide collectively what our main vision or goals are for the coming years. But that 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 coordinator or manager is responsible to carry it through in the way that they see best. And um, and then um, and then they'll have other farmers and 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 uh, employees working with them. You know, in the field. Like if somebody is managing the greenhouse, it doesn't. So Renee manages the greenhouse. Um, she make sure, you know, have enough potting supplies and she makes sure the greenhouse schedules are, are up to date, but, uh, she'll have a couple people working with her, um, to do all the seeding and, you know, all the thinning and watering. And, st um, so she's not alone doing that. And those couple of people that are working with her, that might be employees or might be other partners in the business. Yeah. And, um, often there'll be at least one or two farmers that, that, that work in sort of each, you know, department, if you want to call it that. But progressively, we're having more and more uh, employees doing more of the task. Um, it depends a little bit what time of year we're at and how much there is to do. Right. I would think that the division of resources would be a real challenge in an operation with so many uh, cooks in the kitchen, if you will. You know, deciding like, okay, so there's there's these 16 jobs that need to be done and they're in three they belong to three different farmers and we have this many employees and this many tractors and this many hours in the day how do you guys make those kinds of decisions on an on an ongoing basis you know on that on that really practical day-to-day -day level well i think that it's the day-to-day -day fits into sort of a whole year picture and um to kind of take a couple steps before the day-to-day -day, um we take like over the fall, we take uh, maybe two, three months 
to really plan the coming, to review the previous year and to plan the coming year. So once a week, we'll sit down and meet for half a day and tackle different topics. You know, we take apart, you know, the crop plan, the marketing plan, um, your human resources plan, and we analyze what worked and we figure out what we want to do different. And so over that, that autumn, uh, or the, the fall winter planning, we get plan out the season of what we'd like it to look like and, and, and also really look at what we thought the challenges were the previous year. And so the summer, often we have a good idea of what is a priority based on last year's problems and what are things we're trying to minimize or, or, or reduce the work, uh, what kind of work we do. Um, and then, so that's kind of going in. We try to have, to, to have an idea what what's happening. Um, once the growing season begins, um, every week we have a person who is in charge of planning the, the week. And we have a big blackboard with, you know, each day of the week and also different categories for different types of tasks. And, uh, and, and the weekly planner tries to get an idea of what that week's going to look like. And, um, we rotate the weekly planners based on months. So in May, Reed does the weekly planning because we have a lot of infrastructure projects that need to get done and he tends to manage those projects so he you know he'll make sure the week works so that's prioritized in june um renee plans it because she's been she she often is leading the field plant the field team and she wants to make sure everything gets planted in and all the weeding is on top of at that point um in july emily takes over because she also is a lot involved in the field team so she kind of carries over when Renee's tired of doing that stuff. I take over in August because um, August is a big month for garlic and seed production, which I'm both in charge of. And then September is Fred uh, kind of leading into some of the bulk harvests. And then back to uh, in October, it's back to Renee, who tends to lead the field cleanup. So each month sort of has a theme and that the person who's responsible for the key things in those themes um, plans the week. And then um, every, every Monday, we start the morning with harvest. And then after lunch, once harvest is done for the day, um, we'll meet together in front of the blackboard and we'll have a kind of a meeting for the week. And the person preparing that week will kind of present what they thought, what they thought it might look like. And then at that point, there's feedback from different farmers and different em employees based on things that they might know about. And that kind of, there's a chance to sort of tweak the week a bit then, but afterwards, um, each day we have a, we have a, we have a daily meeting and the weekly planner kind of, you know, sort of sets the priorities and the order of operations for that day. And for the most part, um, we go, we go with it. Um, sometimes there are things that are unexpected and we have to change, but for the most part, we try to keep flow with what that person has planned. And, um, since each farmer has a chance at doing it, you know, their own month, it's easy to uh, to accept and could sort of respect the authority, you know, of the of the of the planner. Though it's you know it's done in a very consensual manner, um, and most of us are also by the time we've been you know organizing three or four planning three or four weeks, we're usually tired of the job and very happy to hand it on to somebody else, and very happy to have someone else make the tough calls. I love the way you've got a, a system that that provides you with some real flexibility in how things are, but also some rigidity in the structure of make of that decision-making. That's really, boy, that's fast. That kind of thing is fascinating to me because I think that's always the balance when you're trying to figure things out on the farm, you know, about how you're going to adapt to a, a rainy Tuesday and a, and a Thursday that's too hot and the crops maybe not getting harvested as quickly as you thought they were going to, or the, you know, the transplanter breaks to have that kind of flow between here's how we're going to do the planning as a, a you know one person in charge but then also with all of these feedback mechanisms built in and then trading it up so that you don't just have one person making the decisions all the time i like that a lot so do we it's <laughs> <laughs> great how did you get to that kind of a of a situation i mean that obviously well, maybe not, obviously, but it would seem to me from the outside that probably when you were starting the farm in 2005, you didn't go, oh, we're going to have this rotation and, you know, one month, one person's going to be in charge of, of 
to planning the tasks and next month somebody else is going to be in charge of planning the tasks. That must have been something that that developed over a course of years. Oh yeah, and it's this is the latest iteration. I'm not sure if it's going to change, but it's the one that's had the most happiness, I think, for all the farmers and all the people involved. Um, in the early years, um, yeah, it's 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 really evolved over the years. In the early years, it tended to be one or two people. You know, actually, I don't even remember what we did in our first couple of years. I think we sort of just met and figured out what we were going to do on the day. And over time, we started to, you know, have a more uh, concrete weekly plan or, you know, blackboard of the plan. And there was a couple of years where I think there was one year where myself, I did, I managed all the, all those, you know, weekly meetings. Another year it was Renee. And it just, it was Early on, you have the energy to do it, but you quickly burn out, and it's hard to keep as much enthusiasm for that. Um, so that's when we started to rotate the task. And for a while, we were rotating between the five farmers, sort of alphabetically, uh, by last name. I think. <laughs> and so one week could be one person, another week another person. And and that that was nice and sharing, but it, it, it was hard for that person to really have a coherent ver- a vision of what you know there's, there there are tasks that we do in one week that are leading into the next couple of weeks and it was hard for that person really to be lining up those tasks well and um uh and that kind of led to um and, and I guess and also just to mix things up at one point we also include, included some of our employees in that rotation and we found that it was a great opportunity for them to kind of think about things but it was a lot of hand folding to get them to 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 lead a meeting and so that's kind of where we we decided to go back to the five farmers leading the meetings and the month strategy something we added in last year and um that that was a real that was a real piece that, uh, that, that made a lot ha- let us a lot more happy. You just talked about having projects that take form over the space of a couple of weeks over the course of the year. And, and you kind of described how each month you have different people in charge of the task planning because of their, their roles and their, their inclinations on the farm. I think this is a nice place to, to kind of pivot and talk about, about, your holistic management approach to the farm. Um, I, you know, I was, I was reading through your stuff and it's one of those, it's one of those things you can kind of see, you can tell the people that have been through holistic management training. There's some, there's some language pieces that, that filter in, but there's also just a way of talking about this plan, monitor and control cycle that, that, is so core to holistic management. How did you guys, how did you guys find that school of thought? Um, so, in the, you know, before I started farming, I read any farming book I could. And, um, you know, holistic management pops up everywhere. So uh, I read quite a bit about it. And in our early years, we tried to self apply um, some of the holistic management stuff. But it was, and, and I think we, I think there was some, some benefit from that. But it was in our fifth or sixth year that we decided to take a six day. Um, holistic management course uh, with Tony and Fran McQuail, who farm near Toronto. Um, uh, so we took a six-day course, all, t- the, all the five of us, and also we brought in um, Fred's wife, Dana, for that course too. So the six of us were there. Yeah, so, and we just, I guess, did the, the full immersion for over those six days. And uh, it was it was tough to do in that it, those six days took place in April, which is a really busy month for us. But they were amazing how they changed the farm. And um, what was really nice of being all six of us taking this course together is that um, we were able to develop, you know, our holistic vision together. And then we were able to practice all the testing questions together. And we were able to hear and be convinced of the value of monitoring and replanning and all that um, together, as, as opposed to one of us telling the others isn't it great if we have a vision and we test questions to it? Um, so in this case, having us all experience it together um, meant it was more buy-in. And um, prior to taking the course, um, we definitely, you know, we do a lot of planning, we do a lot of managing, um, we do a certain, we did a certain degree of monitoring. But a lot of what we were doing was focused on having a profitable farm, in the sense of a farm that generates, you know, revenue for us and that we're able to make a living off of. Um, and 
we all of us would have admitted that you know quality of life is important but we hadn't really totally realized together how quality of life was what was profitable it's that's the most important and the money is just one part of it and so after that um after the workshop it totally shifted the way we would plan for things and the way we'd um evaluate whether something's successful or not and um and suddenly there was a really strong focus on the quality of life element so dan just a second here that when when you talk about how this how this changed some of your your decision making on the farm I mean, do you have an example of that i mean is there an investment that you made or or didn't make or or an enterprise that you guys adopted or dropped because of starting to to raise the importance of those quality of life considerations over the profit um I, so i would say it's not so much an investment that we made or didn't make but it's it's more about just the way we make decisions that that changed and um and I think it's when we're talking and, you know, so we have so many, we have so many different enterprises on our farm and each of us has sort of a vested interest or position in what we want to see happen. And sometimes you get caught up in that when you're planning and making and, and meeting uh, as, as a team. And I think what the holistic management kind of the, sort of this quality of life perspective really made us sort of able to recognize as, as individuals that, wait a minute, you know, it's not so much what I want to see happen on the farm that's important. You know, it's not so much that I want to grow, um, let's say, seeds, or I want to add mushrooms, or I want this kind of roll up on the greenhouse. It's more what's important for us is that we're happy working on the farm. And when we you sort of, re- with holistic management, it kind of, if, you know, somebody can bring back and say, we're looking for the quality of life. We're not we're so much looking for, you know, a technique. And it kind of can break us out of certain cycles of discussion that might happen and just make us remember, yeah, what we're looking for is is that quality of life. It's it's not about the farming technique that we're looking for. It's not about this investment or not. And it's also it's not about defining ourselves in these individual actions. Um, it's just remembering that what we're doing this is because we really like to do this and we really enjoy working together. And, you know, the goal isn't so much to increase pr- pr- uh, productivity in tomatoes or have a better seed yield of something. It's we're looking for a farm that makes us happy. And I don't know if that's too vague of a statement, um, but it's continuously when we're having budget meetings or deciding on things, they, we the holistic management kind of gives us a way out of certain kind of conversations. And, and I, and, and maybe I'd go back. So the sort of two realizations I think that we made with holistic management, one is the, um, the quality of life. The other is if there's anything, so, you know, by the time we t- we did this course, we've been farming for six years or so. Um, we felt we were a pretty successful farm, but there were certain things that, you know, we just kept, kept, um, certain certain things that we just kept not being happy with and you know we realized you know if after six years and doing fairly well you know meeting our financial objectives and our farming objectives there's still certain things that we're unhappy about they don't have to be there and um and holistic management really i don't know if it's the five whys or or what but holistic management really asks you to challenge the way things are and why they are. And, um, uh, and so right from the beginning, after that course, we started changing how we were doing things. Um, uh, you know, one, 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 con- one big decision that happened when we were planning out um, the next season, you know, how much everybody was going to work at different tasks. Um, uh, a couple of, of, well, th- Emily, look, our three co-farmers had already had kids and they'd already had some time off from the season where they, you know, they got to do things that weren't farm related. Whereas for Emily and I, after six years, we'd spent all the summers on the farm and it was starting to, we, we were kind of wanted a little bit of a break. And so we decided that Emily and I would take a month off from the farm to do something else. And, um, and we chose to leave during the month of June (laughs) and, um, which is a time that's crazy (laughs) on farms. Um, but, but we left for a month and Emily and I went on a road trip through, um, 
you know, through the east of Canada and then kind of the northeast of the U.S. and then came back. We also visited a dozen farms during that time. but uh, So we don't get away from farming, but we weren't on our farm. And then we came back and it was just amazing the headspace change and, you know, so much more energy after having been away like that. And, and that kind of thing would have been hard to um, make happen with our previous mindset. That was maybe a little bit more for lack of a better word, Cartesian. With the holistic management, it kind of made us, you know, just put forward what was the important thing and it was kind of the quality of life we were striving for and, and how to do it. And um, for sure, during the month that Emily and I were away, um, our co-farmers had to scramble more and um, and we had, you know, the certain things we hadn't fully expected, but the, you know, they're very capable individuals and, um they pulled off the month without problem. So maybe a little bit, you know, the weed control and the seed production was compromised a bit that year from that month, but everything else, everything was really on top of. And, um, and so it was sort of things like that on big levels, but then also, you know, certain disagreements that we were having about, um, um, just the way we saw ourselves in the farm began to be, uh, you know, holistic management gave us a weight out of those. So Dan, when you, when you talk about things like, like understanding your relationship with the farm or, or understanding, you know, who you are relative to the farm, uh, how has holistic management helped with that? I mean, is there, is there a practical spin that you can put on that for us? Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> so I guess one practical, one practical spin, and this is really the way I guess I would see myself, you know, as a farmer, um, when when I started working on this farm, uh, we started Turn of Soul. Um, I'd been farming and managing other farms for about five years, and I, you know, had a pretty developed skill set. And when we got going, um, I I could see ways that if it was just Emily and I farming on a smaller acreage, we could have a more profitable farm um, in terms of you know of money. And it's definitely something I could see in the first couple of years. Um, and I think what with holistic management, kind of looking at the quality of life, I started to realize at one point that the quality of life that we had was much greater because we were farming with other people than if we had just been farming on our set on our own. Um, we could get away from the farm a lot more. Um, if we're sick or hurt, um, there's people to pick up our work. And, you know, we're able to split the management in ways that doesn't drive us crazy. And um, so, whereas I think in our early years, I would have, you know, I would have really liked to have a farm where I could control everything and really be on top of everything and able to harvest at, you know, top speed and and do really, um, really fantastic. In some ways, it's kind of like if, if um, I, the kind of the farm that I might have seen in those early years is something comparable to what Jean-Martin Fortier has at La Grillinette, who I know he's been a, a guest on your on your show. And something that, you know, a system that's developed really tight around a couple people and that works so well. And um, and working in a team, I felt I couldn't necessarily be as efficient as that. But I think with what I've realized over time and holistic management is a key part of this, though it's also stuff that you realize because, you know, it's happening, um, is that by working with five people, we've been able to accomplish way more than what I could have by myself or just just, just with my wife. And, um, and, and that was a really big realization. And, um, um, and it's, you know, it's changed the way we sort of approach farming a bit in that, you know, earlier on, I was really pro, you know, small area, using it intensively. Um, and, you know, at this point, we have a number of tractors. We're farming um, a lot of acreage. We have, you know, an, uh, an extensive rotation. Um, and, you know, I think I've kind of realized, you know, the system isn't as important as how the system works, um, if that makes sense. Uh, so maybe less ideological and more practical based on our circumstance. So Dan, I, I love I love this about about the quality of life and, and how that affects the decisions that you're making. I imagine that that as a as a cooperative farm and and with that emphasis that you have on the quality of life, this this has some effect on both your daily schedule and on your your overall yearly schedule. 
Yeah, so in our early years where we talked a lot about money, I think what we think a lot more now is about time and the time that we spend doing stuff. And um, yes, yeah, so the quality of life does percolate through all different aspects of our schedule. On one level, it's sort of on a weekly basis. So this coming year, we'll, we start at 7.30 in the morning. Um, we finish at 5 p.m. In, uh, in the afternoon, and we take an hour and a quarter off for lunch. And then um, each farmer and each apprentice also d- works one evening um, till about 7 or 7.30 for a CSA drop-off. Um, and then um, – so that makes you know the weekly schedule is something like you know, 40 – 40, 43 hours a week um, during those hours. And um, and then on Saturday, um, we ro- rotate through the five farmers to go to the farmer's market. So there's only one week in five that I'll be doing a farmer's market, which gi- gives me my weekends. Um, and now I, we do spend a little bit of time outside of the hours on computer, working like a couple hours a week on computer stuff um, or newsletters, other things. But for the most part, that's the schedule that we're working. So it's 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 a very reasonable schedule, and um, and for our employees, we really insist that at five o'clock they go home. We don't um, we don't want people working into the evening unless it's like a really exceptional, you know, planting period or harvest period where we know we're going to get a lot of rain or something. And then if they do work extra, we'll, we'll give them other time off. Yeah. So each farmer will take a week off during the summer, um, in addition to um, into the st- into the statutory holidays that are. That are that are during the season, though we'll rarely take the stat day on the actual day because often we'll have a you know CSA delivery or or something else on that day. But it gives essentially people you know of the five uh, farmer owners of the business, it gives them two weeks that they'll that they'll take in vacation, and usually uh, the couple couples will take the vacation together. Um, we also give our apprentices. You can, they can take the, the statutory holidays when they wish, so they'll often lump them together. Um, and returning employees will get a week of vacation too. Um, so it means that there's a lot of, you know, we put, we put a lot of emphasis on people being able to get away from the farm and doing something different um, in the summer or the early fall, which is, you know, traditional summer vacation time where it's nice to do something other than work hard comes back to that idea of having those five people being very responsible for the operation. I mean, you can, you really can have two of them gone for a week and you've still got three fifths of your management force, uh, as well as your employees there to get things done. It's not like, not like things are just going to grind to a halt. No, things don't grind to a halt. They're always a little bit tougher when we definitely notice when other people are away. And, um, and often, you know, in August and September, it's not unusual to have two farmers and maybe one, sometimes even two employees away. So those weeks, we definitely feel it. But uh, but since we do get some, get get away on our own time, uh, we're very happy to to work harder during the hours that we work for people to to be able to get away. Do you still keep to the same hours when when folks are taking time off? We still keep to those hours. It's great. It's really important to not burn out, and um, we do. And it's something that as farmers, we sort of understand, but um, we've also built a certain amount of flexibility into our schedule as we've begun to have kids that we, you know, we might take off certain half days or, um, you know, there's a little bit of flexibility that's that's come into the farmer schedule. Um, Our employees tend to work, you know, the whole schedule uh, as such. But one thing we've definitely seen in the last few years is that employees do start to get burnt out by the end of August, early September. Um, and really keeping to a schedule and, um, and trying to find ways to reduce the hours a little bit has actually helped out. So, um, in August, we actually, when, when the work actually starts to get heavier, we actually now take off on Fridays at 4 PM instead of 5 PM, just to give, you know, employees a little bit more time for the weekend. And then I love it. That's sort of, that's such a jujitsu move, right? That, that as the work gets harder, you actually take, you know, let's quit working earlier. (laughs) Um, I guess, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry to interrupt there, but I just I I love that idea that that, that you know of, of the that if you people are always so you know it's like how do you motivate employees in 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 October? Well, part of the way you motivate employees in October is by making sure that they aren't overworked in August. Totally, totally, and then and 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 we also. Sh- as of September 1st or so, um, we start working at 8, 8 a.m. instead of 7.30 a.m. So, yeah, it's um, to have people who are alert, attentive, and loving what they're doing in the fall, they got to not be burnt out in the summer. 
Dan, with that, let's stop here for a moment, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back to talk some about uh, crop planting and seed production. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. When you're growing transplants, all of the investments you've made in plant materials, heat, labor, and overhead depend absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And if you're an organic grower, you're probably using a media based on compost. That means you should be looking for the best compost. Most organic potting soils have two basic parts, the compost and everything else. At Vermont Compost Company, Carl Hammer and his crew are very, very intentional about the inputs they put into their compost. While they're making use of waste products, waste disposal is not their primary goal. Ingredients are sourced consciously and with the end in mind. The same goes for the everything else part. Like the best in art, everything in Vermont compost potting soils has a purpose, whether it's the chips of ocean blue granite or the kelp that provides micronutrients and a little smell of the ocean. Fully composted compost, top quality ingredients, and a real sense for the art and the science of plant production, combined with a real commitment to organic growing professionals to create a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming is, it's nice to have something that you can count on. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmers Web, small business software for farmers. Farmers use Farmers Web to streamline work with wholesale buyers, such as restaurants, schools, corporate kitchens, distributors, and retail stores, making working with each buyer easier and increasing the number of buyers your farm business can work with. Taking orders by phone or email, collating them into spreadsheets, and entering them into an accounting program for invoicing takes time that you could be spending on farming and sales or anything other than office work. With Farmers Web, your wholesale customers can place their orders online or you can take their orders over the phone, by email, or in person and enter them in yourself. You can define different payment terms for different buyers, give select buyers special pricing, and generate pick lists, packing slips, and PDF catalogs for your customers. You can keep track of payments that you receive by check or buyer payments by credit card go right into your bank account. Farmers Web can even help facilitate arrangements with third-party logistics providers or help you coordinate deliveries with neighboring farms. A flat monthly fee means that no amount of orders or number of buyers affects your costs, and you can pause, cancel, or switch plans types from month to month at any time, even during the off season. Farmers Web is available to farms, food hubs, and local food artisans nationwide. Farmersweb.com. All right. And we're back with Dan Brisebois, uh talking about holistic management and planning and having a cooperative farm on Turn a Soul Farm. And Dan, you know, I'm kind of curious because I don't speak French. And actually, I think I butcher the pronunciations whenever I have the opportunity to do any French on the show. Um, but what does what does tournesol mean? So tournesol or tournesol um, is French for sunflower. Um, and it's very similar to girasol in Spanish for sunflower. And it's a, it's a play on words. So the tourne, um, so it's people who don't might just be listening to it. It's, it's T O U R N E hyphen S O L. So the tone is, um, means turn. And then, um, the soul means, means the sun. Um, so, so sunflower literally means turn the, turn to, turn to the sun, but it, it's also because it's a play on words. It also means turn the soil. Um, so it's kind of a, I guess a cute name in French. <laughs> I like that. So Dan, um, you're the co-author of of a book that I have sitting on my desk right now, the uh, the crop planning for organic vegetable growers, and this was published by the Canadian Organic Growers. Um, and you and and I think one of your co-farmers wrote this together, right? Yeah, Fred and I wrote this. I was looking through this, and and it's fascinating to me how much you've. Well, this is really where I saw, you know, hey, this is this is a farm that's very much informed by holistic management. And I'm curious, what what prompted you to write a book about crop planning? Before we started Turnisol Farm, um, I was managing another farm for a couple of years and uh, the farmer uh, who, who had hired me um, let me take over the crop planning and she handed me. Um, sort of some of the stuff that she'd done in the past. And she handed me Dan Kaplan's spreadsheets and she said, you know, make a crop plan. <laughs> and, um, and it was something that, you know, Dan Kaplan's spreadsheets were amazing and really, really helped me wrap my head around it. But there really wasn't anything else out there that was really for crop planning. And, um, and I felt that I had, I kind of had to, put together my own system 
of of how to do it. And um, and Fred had a similar experience working for another farm. And um, ultimately, I think you know we you know we created a pretty coherent planning system for our own farm. And um, when uh, I pitched the book to Canadian Organic Growers, essentially I was pitching the book that I would have loved to have been able to read when we were starting farming and, you know, on planning. And, um, and the system, you know, the book that we wrote isn't quite the way we plan now. We planned then, even then it was a little bit, you know, it's a little bit more when you're explaining to somebody, you have to really break it down. You can't do as many intuitive leaps. Um, and it's and and our system has evolved since then too. And if there was a second edition, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, but that's kind of how we came to write this book. It's interesting. I oftentimes get asked to talk about crop planning, and it and sometimes it just seems like such a basic process. I mean, you you figure out what vegetables you're going to need, when you're going to need them, how much land it's going to take to grow them, when you need to plant them, based on when you need them and how much you need, and 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 it's it. I don't know. It's it's something that for me is is very. It's a very logical process, and I really like how you broke it down into this this very linear flow in the book. Did you learn anything new while you guys were writing the book and researching the the other crop planting systems that farms were using out there? By the time that we wrote this book, um, I'd read pretty much anything I could find that was re- associated with you know crop planting. Um, and, and most of agri- like most of the, the, the big farm books too, and um, so I had the pieces together, and um, you know, in, there's nothing really revolutionary or new in the book that we have. It's just that the pieces have never been presented together, and um, and and I think that was really the big thing that we did is taking these pieces that other people are doing independently. And just putting them how they worked, how one leads into the other. And I would agree with you that you know it's it's a pretty simple thing to crop plan. But I think that a lot of new farmers um, are taken aback when they think about you know I'd have to start with each crop one by one, you know, and just go through everything. And it's a little overwhelming for a lot of people, especially if they if, if they if they're not huge on on you know math and and that kind of logic. One of the things that Turn of Soul does that's fairly unusual in the vegetable farming world is that you guys produce seeds and not just for your own use, but you produce a lot of seeds for sale, both at a at a retail packet level, but also to to larger companies who are then reselling what you're selling them. Does that place extra demands on the crop planning at Turn of Soul? Um, yes. Um, but, but and I would say that any enterprise that you have on your farm should be planned out. <laughs> and, um, and I would say the crop plant, like, I mean, if you're livestock, it's a different kind of planning that you're doing, but you know, almost any kind of crop vegetable or fruit or mushrooms, you could probably use the same technique to plan. And, um, and so everything that we do, we, we use the same approach. So with our seed production, we grow hundreds of varieties in any one year. And some of it's for trial. Some of it is for actual production. And, um, uh, Whereas, you know, with, with the vegetables, you might get a feel for one bed of lettuce it gives you so many heads of lettuce and that's enough for, you know, this week of CSA or you should do half a bed. And, you know, over time, there's a certain amount of intuitiveness that comes with it. I find that with seeds, it's, uh, you really have to go back to the numbers and you have to look at how many packets you sold the previous year, how many packets you'd like to sell next year in the next couple of years. Um, Cause often with, with seed, you can hold it over for a couple of years if it, if it germs well. And um, if you're growing something on a seed contract, you want to grow the right amount. You don't want to grow less because you're not going to get paid the full amount and you don't want to grow too much because you might not be able to sell that extra. Um, and uh, so so the crop planning really is a key part of how to link all those numbers together to make sure that you grow what you need um, with a little buffer. I'd, I'd really like to talk about the the seed production that you do. I I actually managed the gardens at Seed Savers Exchange for a couple of years way back in the 1990s and actually worked in the plant breeding department at the University uh of Wisconsin with potatoes and carrots back when I was, was in school and right after school. And I and always have had kind of an affinity for the, for seed saving and, and seed production and, and the whole, all of the genetics that go behind that. 
So I'm I'm really interested. You said you grow how many varieties of seeds a year? We grow a couple hundred um, varieties, and um, you know we grow. There's there's a lot of crops that we. Um, so we we we're growing in well, it's, I mean it's eastern Canada, but it's kind of comparable climate to the northeast U.S. So we have a harsh cold winter, and it's hard to overwinter stuff. Um, we have a summer that's fairly humid and fairly hot. So there's certain crops that we have a hard time with, with like kind of the whole uh, umble family, like carrots, um, and also have a hard time with the quina pods. And onions can be iffy. Um, but there's crops that we do really well with, like you know all the brassicas, um, uh, if we can overwinter them, <laughs> or if we can treat them as annuals. Um, you know all the 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 the, the, the cucurbit family, squashes, melons, cucur- cucumbers, the solanaceae. Um, and then like beans and peas. So, you know, with those crops, we'll grow um, at least one variety of each of those crops. And if if, if we can have a, a smaller isolation distance, like for beans, we might grow, you know, five to 10 varieties of beans in one year. Whereas for cucurbits, we have, you know, we'll grow one main seed cucurbit crop, uh, crop and it's grown in a neighbor's field. So we have a good isolation on it. Um, and so, yeah, for cross pollination, we really have we're really you, you, we can't grow more than that. But uh, but we do grow a number of varieties of the crops that we can grow a number of varieties are on. And then we're always growing. We're, we're increasingly doing trials to make sure that you know the varieties we like are the best ones out there, and um, and and seeing finding new varieties that we want to, to incorporate. So the the seeds that you're growing, then you're doing the genetic maintenance on those as well. It's not like you're buying in stock seed every year from somebody else and growing that out. You're actually maintaining the stock seed yourselves. So for the seed that we grow for our own sale, like direct, you know, direct market sales, we are doing the maintenance ourselves. And um, uh, and that's becoming an increasingly important part of our operation as we've learned how critical it is. But if we grow seed out on contract for somebody, um, it's possible they want you know us to start with our own stock seed, but sometimes they'll also send us the stock seed that they want us to grow out of their of their specific variety. Um, and then usually that that might be a variety that we just grow out for them that one year, and we're not necessarily adding in to our to our catalog. Um, though we do love it when it's varieties that we're already growing and we already know how reliable they are uh, going into it. That's something I think would be a real challenge with growing a new variety from seed. Well, in fact, that I know is a real challenge for growing a new variety from seed is is how much seed a particular crop is going to yield because you don't necessarily know. Oh, yeah. It's a huge challenge. And I kind of got bit by it this year. Um, We were growing – we were supposed to grow out 50 pounds of golden frills mustard. And, um, you know, we grow so many brassica greens, you know, brassica rapa and brassica juncia species. And I have a real good handle – on what is a good yield for it. And this crop, we were aiming for 50 pounds and we grew, you know, 600 bed feet or so of it, you know, almost 2000 plants. And I wound up harvesting about 15 pounds off of it. And I thought that the 50 pounds was already a conservative measure that I might be getting 60 or 75 pounds. And, uh, so I was blown away by it and, um, a little disappointed to be honest. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I much prefer growing stuff that I've grown before, especially when I grew a large amount like that. And um, that was, I think, that was a learning experience. That one, and I wouldn't jump into a variety on that scale without knowing it better in the future. So Dan, I mean, when you're talking about fifty pounds of brassica seed, I mean, well, it's it's kind of like having seven and a half acres of vegetables, right? I mean, it's it's on the one hand, it's a lot of seed or a lot of vegetables, you know, I mean, 50, 50 pounds of brassica seed. If you think about that, a 50 pound sack of these little tiny, you know, arugula seeds, that's a lot. But then if you think about that relative to the kinds of machinery and equipment that are out there for doing seeds, say in Eastern Washington or, or the seed growing regions of the country, the vegetable seed growing regions of the country, it's nothing. So how I'm, I'm really curious, like, how are you, I mean, how are you guys going about harvesting 50 pounds of brassica seed? Um, so we're very, very manual. In general, um, for a crop that's like a dry seeded crop like brassicas or beans, we'll use secateurs or knives or kind of like a, a bill hook to harp to cut the plants and bring in the plant when it's about three quarters uh, ripe. And we'll bring it into the greenhouse and we'll let it dry down there for like another month or so um, to, to after ripen and finish drying. And um, 
and then we'll thresh it. And, and for threshing it, we just have big tarps and we pile it up and then we stomp on it with our feet. For brassicas, that works really well. For peas and beans, we might drive it over with the tractor. But for brassicas, I find stomping goes a long way. And then um, we just collect the chaff and the seed in Rubbermaid bins and we'll, um, we'll screen it with these homemade screens we've made with hardware cloth just to get out the really big stuff and just leave, you know, the the dust and dirt and 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 seeds, and then we'll do some winnowing with some box fans, and that'll get it to a point. We can get it really, really clean uh, at that point, um, clean enough to send it to somebody for them to sell it, or clean enough for us to sell it. In the last couple of years, we've begun to invest in some more specialized equipment, like a spiral separator or you know an office clipper, just to kind of do that last last cleaning better. But um, I've been very happy even before that with what we could get. Um, so, it's, so it's a very manual manual business, or we do it very manually. And in terms of harvest, there's very little that I – like I, I don't see us buying a combine um, or uh, any, any, any kind of specialized equipment. Um, for some of the extraction steps, there are things that, that we're looking at. There's a certain you know a tomato pepper extractor that we're thinking about getting in the next year or two. Um, but – we can do a lot with um, with with the, with the manual tools, and and when I think the machines I'm thinking about getting to, it's just it's not so much that it's not profitable to do manually. It's that we only have so much time to do something in, and um, what I find with bulk seeds, um, like so seeds sold in bulk to other seed companies or even to other farmers or growers, um, is that it's very comparable profitability wise to growing market veg. So. Seeds, I find, often fall in that twenty to forty thousand dollar an acre of gross sales, and um, you know, a twenty thousand dollar crop is on the lowest end of the spectrum. You know, comparable with like growing like bush beans, like snap beans, or you know, snap uh, sugar snap peas, or or melons. You know, for as a market veg, that forty thousand dollar for a, for a bulk seed crop is comparable to growing like bunched carrots or beets, um, you know, at a market price. And, and then there are some crops that you might be getting 60, 70, $80,000 an acre, which, you know, it's awesome to get those, but it's not the majority of them. And so 50 pounds of mustard is probably in the, this year, this, this crop failure, this is not the reality, but what I'd love to get, um, on a, on a bulk brassica green pr- crop is probably something like in that 30 to $40,000 an acre range. And if the yields that, we consistently get or normally get we're there we probably would have been hitting that with with this mustard but uh we're we're we're, we're definitely lower than that so yeah so we're able we do look at our, our our seed crops kind of com- and compare them with with the vegetable crops i guess that leads to an interesting question for me is you just described what's similar about them in terms of the economics what are some of the key differences from a horticultural standpoint between seed growing and vegetable production yeah that, they're yeah they're they're definitely different growing wise. And as such, we grow them in separate areas on our farm. Um, one of the things has to do with irrigation. Um, you know, seed crop likes to be irrigated to get started the same way as a vegetable crop, you know, especially if it's really dry. But once your seeds start to, once your seed crops have flowers, and especially once they start to dry down, like you do not want to get water on them. So we, we use mostly drip tape on any of our seed crops, whereas the rest of the farm is almost all on overhead sprinklers. I mean, tomato, like anything on black plastic might not be, but uh, but most of the crops are overhead sprinklers. Uh, so that's one big difference. Um, another difference is the length of time that a seed crop is in the ground, um, uh, you know, depending on the crop. Um, but if, if I was growing a tat soy or a mizuna for, for seed, um, you know, as a market veg, it's like four to five weeks and then you can harvest it as a baby leaf, maybe six or seven weeks and you're harvesting like, a, you know, a head. Um, but you got to add one to two months more for the actual seed crop. So they're in the ground so much longer than the, seed, than, than the vegetable crop is. And we separate them because, you know, once our vegetable crops are finished, we get in there, we incorporate it, and we put a cover crop down. Um, so we don't want to have, you know, seed crops f- popping up here and there. And like, we don't want to have, like, seed crops lingering in a vegetable crop block. So that's that's two differences. And one other difference is that, your seed, no matter how well you harvest, you aren't going to harvest all the seeds. So there's a certain amount of seed that will shatter, and that becomes a weed seed for your subsequent crop. So we 
after a seed crop, we never till the ground um, or we don't till the ground immediately because if we bury all those seeds, we're going to see them popping up for years. Um, instead, we'll leave the ground um, undisturbed for, until the fall and we'll let you know mice and beetles predate on the seeds and then a certain amount of the seeds will germinate and in some cases we can actually get a salad mix cut off of that uh, off of some of the seeds <laughs> um and uh, though we don't bank on it um and then we'll let it winter kill in the winter and then the next spring we'll till it under and we almost always follow follow a seed crop with a cover crop uh uh, like a cover crop year just to flush out any more seeds that are there. So when we go back to a, to, to, to a crop the year after the cover crop, the ground is fairly clean. I really like that. I think it's actually a great strategy if, if the weeds do get away from you uh, in, a, in a regular vegetable field too, to just leave them standing over the winter. You know, if they're still there in the fall, let those and, and it's painful sometimes to to leave them there but um you know maybe mowing them but but trying to end up with as many of those seeds on the top of the ground as possible so that you do get that predation i think is a really important strategy with with uh with any kind of weed control when it when it gets out of control totally agree with you okay so i know just enough about genetics dan to be to be really dangerous but i <laughs> i i do know you know one of the things that i that i observed when i was doing seed work was was the amount of uh, how rapidly populations could shift, you know, if you, if you don't actually put the intention into doing the selection. So, you know, when you're, when you're growing out an open pollinated variety, right, you're not just, you're not just planting every seed that you harvested and harvesting seed from everything that comes up. You're actually getting out there and doing these, doing the selections and, and keeping that variety moving in the direction that you want it to move. Uh, yeah. And that is really the, the wonder of seed saving that varieties do change and um and through saving your own seed the variety gets better and better for your farm and your system so you used the term maintenance and it's definitely seed maintenance that we do but it's it's through selection and we're selecting our seed crop sort of at every step that we interact with it so in the spring if we're starting the, the, the crop in, indoors in a greenhouse we'll seed three to five seeds uh, per, per, per cell. Um, and when, once the true leaves come up, we'll thin down to one seed. So we're our, or one seedling. So we're sort of selecting a, you know, at that point for German vigor, depending on how much we trust the seed and whether it's to really bulk it up or not, we'll probably gr grow 30 to 50% more seedlings than we're going to plant out specifically for, for the seed production. And we'll only plant out the best looking seedlings. And, and some of that is based on vigor, but also it's you know based on true to true, trueness to type. So if, if we're growing a, a Mizuna and there's one that has really round, dark leaves, that one's not going to get planted out. So by the time it gets into the field, we've already kind of done a little bit of selection pressure on it and a little bit of maintenance. And um, uh, I just try to walk the fields, my crops, my seed crops at least once a week or even a couple times a week. And, um, I, you know, I ruthlessly eliminate anything I don't like. And that might be based on, you know, if, if it's a different leaf shape or a different, um, you know, if it's, if it's not, if it has different phenotype characteristics, different true, if it's not true to type, but I also eliminate anything that's not doing as well as the bulk of the population, you know? So, um, it might be a little bit wimpier. It might be a little bit more flea bit or more damage, more pests on it. Um, it might show a little bit of disease or more disease than the rest of the plants do. So I'll, I just try to cull that. Um, you know, in general, I'm probably not culling more than, you know, five, 10 percent of the population because I do. If it's a variety that we're, we're, we're just maintaining at normally, you know, you do want to get the seed off of it. So you don't want to you don't want to. To, to, to push too hard on it. If you have to push really hard, it's probably not ready to be a market seed crop. And then even once things start to bolt, um, I'm looking at, um, you know, the flowers and the way the seed set happens, kind of selecting on those characteristics. And, then, you know, if it's a, it's a squash or tomato, um, you're looking at the fruit, but then you can also select based on the storage and based on the type. Um, so, so that's kind of happening at all steps. And I do that on the bulk of the population. At the same time, I'm looking for the individuals that I just love. And um, uh, like we, we grew a bok choy crop last summer. And, um, you know, the bulk of the population had started to flower. Um, and there were some 
of the bok choys that were still standing there and just looked like perfect little vases. And I flagged 20 or 30 of them to, to just remember that I really love those plants, you know? And then when I go back at other times, I do look, I, I do look at the ones that I love to see if I still love them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when I, cause you know, sometimes it's just a fleeting thing, you know? Um, when it comes time to harvest the seed, I, make sure to harvest the seed from the flagged one separately. And often I will harvest all the seed from one flagged plant and put it together in one envelope. You know, I'll bring out screens and a, you know, a bin just to do a bit of quick cleaning and get all that seed into an envelope and then harvest the rest of the plants um, together. And then, so the next time I grow that seed stock out, half the plants I grow out might be the bulk seed that I grew, but then the other half, will probably come from the 20 or 30 plants that I really liked better. And um, it'll give me a chance to see whether those plants are better than the main plants, than, than the main population was. Um, and in some cases, I might, you know, I might chart harvest 60 or 70 of the best individuals to really just create a whole new or, or more spe- more refined starting seed for the next year. So I'm kind of, and that's something that I've really learned in the last three or four years, how important or, or, the, or the value and the potential value of just really looking at what seed will be producing your next seed. One of the things I love about, about seed production is it really, it kind of closes a certain loop with, with regards to this, this question of management and, and this idea that, that you're actually, it's, it's not just a matter of taking what you get. It is a matter of actually managing that population and, and making really conscious choices about, you know, who lives, who dies, who gets to breed who doesn't and and what the outcomes are that you're that you're actually trying to create you know if you're selecting for late bolting that can actually be the opposite of selecting for absolute seed production yes it's it's, it's it, that's, that's true and um the way you're, tri- you're you're selecting might not be for absolute seed production though you can select for that too but that comes into a little bit at what price you sell your seed for if um if the selection pressure that you're doing yields a better variety but a less you have less seed yield, then you just sell that seed for more. Um, and um, consider, assuming people are willing to pay more for that uh, improved variety that you have to offer. Has it taken a lot of work to learn about the different species that you're doing seed collection on? I mean, your catalog is is really broad. It has. It's it's taken a lot of work, and it's still like it's it's ongoing. I'm still learning things consistently. Um, Initially, you know, I read through seed, the Susan, Susan Ashworth Seed to Seed book. Um, I read through any kind of seed book that was available, and there wasn't that much available, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I first started getting into seed. And um, But, you know, the proof is in the pudding. It's, it's when you start growing the stuff out and saving the seed. And um, in the first two or three years – it was sometimes a gamble whether the crop would be would would work or not. I really had to figure out good spacing for my bean and pea varieties. Um, the fact that you know beans for seed are in the ground so much longer than snap beans, and our 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 field, it, you know, our, our our weather is so humid in the summer that we usually abandon fresh beans because the plants have succumbed to disease. And you know, so, so that's just not good for a seed crop. So I've had to learn how to space things further apart to have better ventilation and a better disease control. Um, I've had to learn about what dates to plant things so that, uh, like with brassica greens, you know, I've had to learn that you plant them as early as possible so that they bolt sometime in late June, early July. So we can get the harvest, the seed harvest in in August. And if we plant them too late, they will invariably bolt, but they don't necessarily produce a good seed set. Um, and so there's just there's a lot of books to read, but it's really figuring, you know, growing it yourself that, uh, that, 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 that we've done. And growing it yourself is where you learn how the crop responds to your area. Um, because sometimes a seed, a, a, a seed reference uh, might be for, you know, for California or the West Coast or, you know, the, 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 the you know, or, or, or somewhere in Europe. So it won't necessarily respond the same way in your climate. Um, and so just growing thing after thing. And I've grown just about every species at least once. And um, those that I fail with, you know, I usually wait a couple of years before trying again. Um, and those that succeed, uh, well, so when I do a trial, you know, we're growing, you know, 10 or 15 feet of it. We're not going to grow 200 or 300 feet. Um, 
or sometimes I'll even grow just five feet of something for a trial. And if it does well, I'll grow more the next year. And if it does exceptionally well, I might grow a lot more the next year, but usually I'll, I'll, I'll increase um, uh, cautiously. But it, it has been, you know, I worked on vegetable farms, CSA farms, market garden farms before doing before we started Turnisol, and I got really well trained in by the people I worked for. And um, and we started our vegetable production. I think I think we were top notch growers because we were five people with solid experience. And um, uh, not to say we don't have vegetable challenges now and then. We've had to learn some things, but with the seeds, um, I think it took us you know between you know five and seven years to kind of get to. A similar place as we are with the vegetables. And now, you know, this we're very we're very reliable on a lot of crops, um, and uh, and I know what is more risky when I grow it. All right, so Dan, that's that's really great. Thank you for sharing that with us. I just I think the like I say I think the seed production is just fascinating. Um, let's turn now to our our lightning round that we like to do at the end of every show, and uh, and I I guess. You having just bragged that you've uh, you've grown every species of vegetable <laughs> out to seed. Um, what's your what's your favorite crop to grow? Um, my favorite seed crop to grow is uh, is brassica greens, probably brassica rapa, but uh, brassica gentia is a close favorite. <laughs> so which which remind us which which crops are in that brassica uh, yeah. rapa? So brassica rapa includes like the tatsoi, uh, mizuna, turnips, rapini, uh, Chinese cabbage. A lot of the Asian greens are brassica rapa, and brassica juncia is the the spicy mustards like um, like giant uh, red giant red Osaka purple or you know green wave. Those are the brassica juncia. What is it that appeals to you about those? I just I love the way. So I love each step of it. You know, I love when you're growing it out. Um, the the leaf shapes and the tastes and um, we do a fair amount of crossing with stuff too for some of our selection and I love the diversity that comes out of those th- th- those crops um, when they go to seed um, it's I just love the seed harvest uh, the, I, I find it really uh, they're, they're kind of a lot of the crops can be easy to harvest but 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 those I find they just go so smoothly and uh, and I find I can get a really good job cleaning them out with, uh, you know, screens and, uh, and fans. So it's just really, really satisfying. And I think that I have a special place in my heart for them because they're some of the first crops that I think I really started to master. And, um, yeah, so I just love those guys. Great. And what's your favorite tool on the farm? So my favorite tool, uh, is actually our staff, you know, our, our employees, it really is one of the things if you can wield them properly is is really one of the most versatile and and potentially the most productive tool out there. Yeah, it's um I think that um we could not accomplish the diversity of stuff and the scale of operations we do on the farm without them. And um over the years, you know, the five farmers have moved to doing less and less field work because there's so many other things to do, you know, so much office stuff to do, newsletter stuff to do, you know, marketing. And, um, the, the st- you know, our, our employees are what make, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of the farm work and they're doing it well. And, um, and you know, it's, it's nice to work with, you know, with great people. Any, any great tips for employee management? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think, um, you really have to learn how to communicate. Um, It's, um, I think that often we'll ask something of our employees, which seem crystal clear to us. And then we'll realize that, uh, it really wasn't that clear based on the results that we get. You really have to learn the kind of tasks. I think you have to think about the tasks that you're doing in all the different steps and really be able to, 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 to transmit what you want at each step. Um, you know, one thing that, um, you know, one thing that we had happen, I think it was two years ago um, during the garlic scaping. Um, so we we grow a lot of garlic. We leave some garlic scapes on specifically to get the bowl bills that we then use, you know, for propagation and also for sale. And there was a little bit of a misunderstanding with our with our staff. And there were some beds that if like, you know, two thirds of the bulb of, of the scapes were left on the garlic. And, and that, that does have an impact on the sizing. And, um, and it really came down to, I hadn't explained myself well, you know? And so this year we, 
clearly flagged off what was being saved for bull bills um, with big, you know, stakes and marking t- uh, and flagging tape. And, you know, I was quite clear that at the end of the scaping season, we shouldn't see any scapes be- outside of those areas. And that was something that was just very easy to understand. And then it wasn't, uh, is this escaped escape area or not escape area, you know? And with the clear instructions, people can just do awesome stuff. And then, you know, we talked quite a bit about holistic management and you, you mentioned doing a lot of reading. Did you actually read the entire holistic management book from cover to cover? The Alan Savory book? Yes. I have yeah. read it um, from cover to cover and um, there are sections I've read a number of times. <laughs> I love it. You don't meet many people who've actually made it through the whole thing. It can be kind of a thunker. <laughs> it, it, it is, but um, um, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last book that you read? Um, the last fiction book I read was Kindred by, by Octavia Butler. All right. And if you could choose a farmer superpower, what would you choose? I would love to have total crop planning and record keeping recall. <laughs> All right. So that when your organic inspector came, they didn't actually have to look at anything. You could just you could just relay it all verbally. Yeah. And when you're out on the field with a pile of trays, you know where it goes where and, and all that. Nice. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Um, in, in function of the seed business, I would tell my, 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 my young farmer self to start doing trials earlier and to start focusing on the stock seed that we're growing out earlier. If, if I was to tell about just general farm stuff, one thing that I would tell my young self in the early years is how great it is to work with, with, with in, a, in a collective cooperative opportunity uh, uh, farm and how much better, um, you know, you can, you know, I really can achieve a lot more working with a cooperative model than working on my own, as we talked about earlier. Dan, thank you so much for your time this morning. This has been a really enlightening interview, and I feel like we've covered a lot of, a lot of territory that people have been asking to hear about. And I'm, really excited about the the idea of the cooperative farm as something that has potential to really help with those land access issues. But I think the, all the nuts and bolts issues that we talked about in regards to that, really important considerations in that. Thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome. It's been an honor to be on the podcast. I've been listening since the beginning, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 50 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Breeze Bois. That's B-R-I-S-E-B-O-I-S. B-R-I-S-E-B-O-I-S. You didn't think I was going to make you spell that yourself, did you? It's been a while since I made a big deal out of it, but we really do work hard to make the show notes on farmer to farmer podcast.com a valuable resource by providing quotes from the show and links to the resources that are mentioned in the course of the conversation. It's worth checking it out if there's something you heard about that you want to follow up on. I'm getting very excited about my upcoming two day short course on making your market farm work. That's in Kansas City on January 25th and 26th, which is just around the corner. We're going to talk about how you can take your farm to the next level with management that helps you monitor and improve your performance in all areas of your farming operation. Schedule and registration information is available at cultivatekc.org. Dan talked about the importance of communication when it comes to employees, and that's something we'll be covering in depth at my employment workshop in Grays Lake, Illinois, on February 17th. More information at purplepitchfork.com slash betterboss. I'm also looking forward to my trip out to Corvallis, Oregon for the Oregon State University Small Farms Conference on February 20th and my organic university session at the Moses Organic Farming Conference on February 25th. If you enjoy the podcast, I hope you'll check out my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook or wherever you want to tell them about it. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things and I know a lot of farmers, but I know that I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>